everyone, my name is Wafa Uto. In this video presentation, we are going to discuss about artists and artisans. Do you know what is the difference between artists and artisans? If you don't know yet, then listen carefully. An artist is a person who creates arts, such as paintings, sculptures, music, or writing. And they are using conscious skills and creative imagination. And artisan is a worker who practice a trade or handicraft. An artisan is essentially a manual worker who makes items with their hands and who through skills, experience, and talent can create things of great beauty as well as being functional. Both artists and artisans can use their hands to make things and both can be professionals or amateurs. Remember, artists and artisans are both making art. In the advent of technology, it is remarkable what has now been made possible. With a click of a button, an array of overwhelming information is made available, informing every aspect of human life. In the fast-paced and highly complex 21st century, there is a real and nagging fear that soon everything may very well be replaced by computers and robots that can arguably do things with more precision at a shorter amount of time and less capital in the long term. It means men are afraid and they are having continual or recurring worry or anxiety. Since we are now near in the future, which means a high-tech world, they are worrying because they think that everything will be replaced by a robot and man will be not serviceable anymore. The nihilist notion is confessed by what are arguably the most resilient qualities of man, which is the creativity and imagination of a man and as long as there is a cultivation of both of these qualities which is the creativity and imagination no robot or artificial intelligence can replace man just yet yes it is true may robots copy humans but they can be they can't be good as human beings Humans can imagine anything in this world, existing or not existing. Nihilist is the belief that a value are baseless and nothing can be known or communicated. It is often associated with extreme pessimism and a radical skepticism that condemns existence. A true nihilist would believe in nothing have no loyalties and no purpose other than perhaps an impulse to destroy. The art is one of the most significant ways in which we try to grapple with how the present unfolds. In Robert's hands, the art spirit, he stated that art, when really understood, is the province of every human being. It is simply a question of doing things anything well. It is not an outside extra thing. When the artist is alive in any person, whatever his kind of work may be, he becomes an inventive, searching, very self-expressing creature. He becomes interesting to other people. He disturbs, upset, enlightens, and he opens ways for a better understanding. Where those who are not artists are trying to close the book, he opens it, shows there are more pages possible. There is a gap when one continues to persist with the idea that art is something that is detached from the everyday. In what has been reduced to a blur, it becomes more integral that man pursues a better understanding of the world where he lives. One of the avenues what make this possible and exciting is the engagement with art and culture. This wonderful book by Robert Henry an artist and teacher of art almost a century ago, it is not only has great advice and suggestions for artists, but it strikes humans that everything in this book can be applied to all aspects of life. To me, it's all about paying attention, being mindful, trusting yourself, and having fun with no expectations. Having fun with no expectations. 
everything that meditation teaches us. This lesson will introduce the artists who have dedicated their lives to the cultivation of the arts through the works of great creativity, imagination, and daring throughout history. It aims to expand this into the wider world of the arts and culture, wherein other key players and mo movers are testament to how the production, consumption, and distribution of arts have changed profoundly. So let us get started and there are five prepared questions and all we need to do is you're gonna answer it and I'm going to answer it too and then we are going to compare our answers. Ready? First question is what art form can you most relate to and appreciate? My answer is painting. What's yours? The second question is, name an artist whose works you really like. My answer is, Van Gogh. Third question is, is there a particular work of art created by him or her that you relate to and appreciate? What is it and why? My answer is, there are various interpretations of Starry Night, and one is that this canvas depicts hope. The fourth question is, with your seat may discuss and compare the items you listed. But since we are not able to compare our answers because we are doing online class, what we are going to do is you are going to compare my answer to your answer. Fifth question is, based on what you wrote, make an assumption about what the painting means. My answer is, it seems that Van Gogh was showing that even with a dark, even with a dark night such as this, it is still possible to see light in the windows of the houses. Furthermore, with shining stars filling the sky, there is a always light to guide you. Starry night painting has a very deep meaning. Even though you're in your worst, always remember that there's a rainbow after the rain. In Peter Drucker's seminal book, Post-Capitalist Society, 1993, he stated that the real controlling resource and the absolutely decisive factor of production is neither capital, not land, nor labor. It is knowledge. Instead of capitalists and proletarians, the classes of the post-capitalist society are the knowledge workers and the service workers. Peter Drucker claimed in his book that the real capitalist is not the one in control, but rather the knowledge of a human. He also claimed that people working in the creative industries are key influencers and movers in society. But who are these people? Maybe he meant artists when we talk about art and not business. Because artists work hard for their arts and because they don't dominate people's mind with their masterpieces but rather with the knowledge that we have. Arts have traded a long history. Their roots can likewise be traced in one of the major milestones in human civilization. So now, I am going to show you a video where we can know how the art continue its history and it is because of the artist why it till now exists. The video is the first episode of the video series, New Ways of Seeing, project by the New York Times, The Brand Studio, and Jewelry Giant Tiffany & Co. Art critic Jerry Salt, 2016. So, let's, let's watch it. Hi, I'm Jerry Saltz, and I'm here to talk to you about art. Sandro Botticelli, Picasso, Marcel Duchamp. The invention of a system. 
There are more images in our day-to-day -day lives than there have ever been before. But how is the way we see this connected to the way we see this? To answer this question, I think it's helpful to look at the first instances of art that we know of. Cave paintings are as significant in the development of human history as the wheel, fire, coffee. Wow. These first artists invented a way to get the three-dimensional world into two dimensions and attach value to their own ideas. And all of the history of art flows forth from this invention. Think of Picasso as a cave painter, someone who needs to see stuff and have everyone else see what he sees. He fragmented the figure so that he and you can see every part of a body, front, back, even standing and lying down at the same time. Duchamp is like a Neolithic stone sculptor. He arranges old materials to be seen in a new way. We're all still using the same operating system that was created in the caves. For example, Chantal, you're a modern day cave painter. Where does your work come from? My work's a mixture of lines and words and characters, and I allow the pen to kind of tell me where to go, and I just follow. We can identify where art came from, but do we really understand it? Hey, Kehinde, <laughs> what does your art mean? Art is about changing what we see in our everyday lives and representing it in such a way that it gives us hope. Artists of color, gender, sexualities, we're creating a revolution now. Whoa, this is really getting complicated. What'd you just do there? Well, I took a portrait I painted in my studio and, and uh, I plunged it into a vat of paint. You sort of destroyed the painting? Well, there's a fine line between creation and destruction, isn't there? Maybe I completed the painting. Boom! This inherent subjectivity is what keeps art thriving. You know, sometimes I look at Rembrandt and he's like Shakespeare. Other times I look at him and I think, it's so brown. The art world likes to ask, can art save the world? And everybody wants to say yes. Eh, I disagree. But art does change the world by changing how we see and therefore how we remember. This is gonna look so great on my wall. You see what I did there? It's the same cave, but it just got a lot bigger. <laughs> Art contains multitudes, like us. Out of the shadow of these caves, outstanding headway was seen moving down to history from Rome's age to the Middle Ages. In the terms of how man continued to utilize his surroundings to create varying expressions of his ideas and feelings. Through the exploration of his immediate environs, trade and other experimentations, new modes, media and techniques brought to light a wide array of artworks that instantiate the wealth that can be done when the artist's vision is tapped. Amazed and realized. But the most integral development that allowed this identity of an artist to fully emerge is the systematization and sophistication that his world, the art world, has become. The impulse to create is at the core of human civilizations, much like the impulse to communicate through language. Artists in those ancient times created works of art with profound significance. These works, such as the carvings on the cave walls, are images of the lives they live. We can also see from these ancient works of art that they symbolically represented everything in those people's lives, including their rituals and the discovery of fire. Because of these carvings and other works of art, Archaeologists have been able to study life and solve some mysteries and we can also think what is the meaning of the art. Artists even created places and spaces where communities may gather. There are numerous monuments and memorials that are plotted all over the world, such as the 
and famous Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. Cave paintings that have an aura of misery like the Pyramids of Giza. And the historical monument in England, Stonehenge. It was in this light that artists work and the most of the time. Their products were considered not as artwork at all, but rather as craft or place under some other category. The use of the word embedded may be taken to mean that what was created automatically circulated in the operations of society and was not integral to an art but object that identity of its maker be known. It did not take long before this change. Good day to all and especially to you, Ma'am Delendo. I am by Sahedo Gito Tukali from BSCD1C. So, my assigned topic is all about the artisan and the guilds. So first, let us define what is artisans. For those who are not familiar of what artisans really are. So, artisans is a craftsman such as the carpenter, carver, plumber, blacksmith, weaver, embroiderer, and the person who likes to produce directly functional or uh, decorative arts. So, an artisan is a manual worker who makes uh, items with his hands. So, gamit yung skills niya or yung experience or yung talent, he or she can create things of great beauty as well as being functional or may purpose or may panggagamitan ka. So craftsmen and builders in the past did not have sophisticated terminologies and principles that architects and engineers abide by today. Yet, they fulfilled overlapping roles such as the draftsman, architect, engineer, and even as the builder. So, have you ever wondered why some examples of artistic and creative production have survived to this day? It's simply because of the craftsmen and the builders back then. So, unlike now, we have engineers and architects. So, it's easy for them to create or to do their works kasi meron na tayong new technologies and uh, more technologies. So unlike before, what they had was the sense on how materials behave, how the environment, light, and weather patterns affected structures, and the other intuitive principles of creation. At hindi mawawala sa kanila yung experimentation and luck. So what made the difference between before and now was the materials, medium, and the principles behind the process of their creation. So artifacts and the interesting objects from all over the world that have survived centuries for us all to see. So it's still magnificent structures that are often appreciated not only for their historical significance but more so for their aesthetic characteristics that render them unique. So one of the main examples of early Gothic Cathedral would be the Cologne Cathedral. So Gothic Cathedrals along with other structures inspired by its architectural tenets have survived through time. Not only by their sheer durability but more so through the articulation of the processes that they follow. And the Cologne Cathedral is located in Germany. And kaya siya nag-survive to this centuries or to this day is because these guilds were prevalent during the Middle Ages, particularly during the 13th to 15th century, where towns had formalized groups of artisans or craftsmen who took on a particular specialization or trade. Shoemakers, textile and glass workers, carpenters, carvers, masoons, armorers and weapon makers. So the practice of artists was not grounded on the idea of individual capacities of success. Rather, in the commitment to work together as a collective. Guilds were a type of social fellowship, an association structured with rules, customs, rights, and responsibilities. With a lifetime commitment to a particular trade, an artisan develops immense skill and expertise in his craft. 
the account was that Master Mason Gerald Grile started the project in 1248 but was only completed roughly 600 years later, claiming the record as one of the longest construction projects today. So, ang may-ari or ang namumuno pala nitong uh, Cologne Cathedral is si Master Mason Gerald Grile. So, imagine 600 years, almost 600 years siya bago natapos. So, ganun talaga nila pinatibay at pinaganda itong uh, Cologne Cathedral. So, as you can see, in the Middle Ages pa yan siya. So, it's still shining, shimmering, splendor. So, this is the guild niche under the four crowd states. This was commissioned by the Arte de Mestri de Petra Ilag. Legname, Guild of Wood and Stone Cutters. So a master artisan or craftsman would then be open to hiring apprentices who would be under his tutelage and instruction. In these guilds, artistry and technology flourish under the roof. In the context of the cathedral construction site, the master mason oversaw the work by numerous men of varying artistic Proclivities, proclivities and skills from the smiths, metalwork, carpenters, carriers, and glazers. So, this brought to light various ways of thinking, of thinking about transferring knowledge and skills by visualizing and articulating the principles, processes, and tricks of the trade, both in words and in print through manuals and publications. Of course, these printed publications were done cheaply and did not have the same thoroughness as with handbooks and manuals of biblical proportions. Aside from funds, another hurdle was the fact that some of the knowledge that went into production was difficult to put into words. This can be attested in a way that often we find ourselves at a loss when tasked with explaining a particular step or process in something that we created. In addition to the fact that receiving the explanation of how something is made does not automatically make us impresarios who can carry out the task by free. So an example of artists is strongly influenced the visual arts was Albrecht Durer. Albrecht Durer was born in 1471. His father was a goldsmith. That is why he also apprenticed as such. Later on, he shifted to the visual arts. So, his life was ripe with travels, fame, and fortune. So, during that time, it was customary to travel after completing an apprenticement to gather more experience and knowledge elsewhere. So, he also published quite a number of books and treatises, including those that talk about practical skills as an artist, which would be useful to other uh, artisans and craftsmen who dared to read it. Mostly on perspective and human proportion, his works were written in the first person singular format, practical in a way in it was written and was supported by illustrations. It also helped that his illustrations were laid out opposite the text that explains it. Although he was caught between the time and canons were still being followed, he suggested to his readers that it was merely recommendations and that if they found a better way to go about it, then one should depart from what he explains it. Although he was caught between the time and canons were still being followed, he suggested to his readers that it was merely recommendations and that if they found a better way to go about it, then one should depart from what he had learned. Okay, so the culture of artisans became prevalent in the Philippines, particularly during the Spanish colonial period, formerly done with the spirit of the communal and the everyday patronship changed the way art was perceived. 
This was both the case for religious and secular art, wherein the existence of artisans proved to be of immense use. So although the timeline is a bit skewed, the culture of artisans became prevalent in the Philippines as well. So it was through mimesis or copying that artisans first learned to depict religious images and scenes. Friars, being non-artistic themselves, provided the references that artists could use. During the propagation of the faith, Spanish friars commissioned a lot of artisans to carve, paint, and engrave images for churches and public sites. So as you can see in this picture, this is the Church of the Most Holy Trinity in Loai, Bohol. So one of the examples of a Spanish architecture that has been documented in the Church of the Most Holy Trinity in Loai, Bohol, built in 1822, the ceiling paintings were rendered Trump style depicting biblical scenes. In 2003, it became a national historical landmark. It was therefore unfortunate that, that this church was one of those heavily damaged during the devastating earthquake that rattled Bohol in 2013. The only section of the structure that remained struck was the bell tower. Although it is a fragment of the real thing, the photos taken by Project Kisame were able to document the beauty of the ceiling paintings prior to its destruction. So from the church, the next patterns of the arts were the then new alight, the illustra illustrados or the middle class. Along with foreign guests who wanted souvenirs to take along with them, in the previous chapter, it was mentioned that portrait paintings become a fad, were painted. Two other important genres for painting at the time were the tipos del país and letras y figures. So one of the key examples that illustrated this, the systematization of art instruction was the establishment Damian Domingo of the Academia de Dibujo, known as the best tipos del país painter. This school specialized in teaching the miniaturismo style of painting along with the tenets of classical European painting. Eventually, other schools emerge, teaching other genres such as bodegons, still life, and paisages, landscape. The first Academy of Arts or School of Arts here in Philippines was the Academia de Bujo y Pintura. So, ang nag-establish niyan ay si Damian Domingo. So, ito yung uh, first Academy dito sa Pilipinas. So, matatagpuan niyan doon sa Manila. Okay, so let's proceed into the artist and his studio. So, uh, most pivotal developments included the transformation of the craftsman to an artist or an independent artist, the widespread patronization of secular art alongside the continuous production of works with religious subjects, and the assertion of cognition, the will, and individuality. Artists claiming authorship for their works by affixing their mark onto the surfaces of their paintings were a big milestone in the history of the artist. So moving back to Europe, the big shift that propelled the evolution of the pivotal rule of the artist in the arts started during the Middle Ages up to the Renaissance period. So this resulted in a wider variety of artworks, not just in form, but more so in style and technique. The site that saw this ship was a very personal space for the artist, so which is the studio. So as you can see, the picture here is the studio of the artist. 
or what they call the artist studio. So today, the artist studio have been a place of interest in public. It is interesting to see and learn where creativity manifests itself. Especially since an artist studio is an extension of the artist. So, the studio model dates back to the Renaissance, therein artists flex their relationship with their patron as a site where negotiations and works were made. There were those whose workstations were segmented into two, the studio, the, the studio law, and the bottega. The latter is where the work usually happened. Apprentices studied under mater, masters, assisting with manual, assisting with manual tasks of the preparation of the painting's surfaces. So, in the 17th century, these demarcations or this separation became loose. Criticisms and analysis were highlighted as integral aspects of a art engagement and therefore the display of the artworks through official art salons was sought for. To be included in the exhibition was deemed an honor, especially since it did not take a while before it was considered an arbiter or standards and taste. So in France, uh, on the other hand, Academies and art salons became popular as they as they did not only support the production of art but also uh, discourse around them. Other players in the world of art. So as you can see in this picture, in the art world, this is their prominent truth with their mandatory relationships. So the terrain in which the artist travel, traverses is becoming increasingly complex. In the last century, some of the rules that have been existent since the beginning of widespread patronization of secular art alongside the continuous production of works with religious subjects and the assertion of cognition the will and individuality. Artists claiming authorship for their works by affixing their mark onto the surfaces of their paintings were a big milestone in the history of the artist. So moving back to Europe, the big shift that propelled the evolution of the pivotal role of the artist in the arts started during the Middle Ages up to the Renaissance period. So this resulted in a wider variety of artworks, not just in form, but more so in style and technique. The site that saw this ship was a very personal space for the artist, so which is the studio. So as you can see, the picture here is the studio of the artist or what they call the artist studio. So today, the artist studio have been a place of interest in public. It is interesting to see and learn where creativity manifests itself. Especially since an artist studio is an extension of the artist. So, the studio model dates back to the Renaissance, therein Artists flex their relationship with their patron as a site where negotiations and works were made. There were those whose workstations were segmented into two, the studio, the, the studio law, and the bottega. The latter is where the work usually happened. Apprentices studied under mater, masters assisting with manual assisting with manual task of the preparation of the painting's surfaces so in the 17th century 
these demarcations or this separation became loose. Criticisms and analysis were highlighted as integral aspects of art engagement and therefore the display of the artworks through official art salons was sought for. To be included in the exhibition was deemed an honor, especially since it did not take a while before it was considered an arbiter or standards and taste. So in France, uh, on the other hand, academies and art salons became popular as they, as they did not only support the production of art but also uh, discourse around them. Other players in the world of art. So as you can see in this picture, in the art world, this is their prominent rules with their mandatory relationships. So the terrain in which the artist travel, traverses is becoming increasingly complex. In the last century, some of the rules that have been existent since the beginning of art history have been uh, properly dealt with ascribed with a name and legitimized into a sophisticated network or relationships and exchanges. So this network is what we call the art world. So this picture is the exhibition opening of Arctic Hysteria, the new art from Finnet. So in Harold S. Becker's Art Worlds, 1982, he asserted that all artistic work, like all human activity, involves the joint activity of a number, often a large number of people. So through their cooperation, the artwork we eventually see or hear comes to be and continues to be. The work always shows signs of that cooperation. The forms of cooperation may be ephemeral, but often become more or less routine, producing patterns of collective activity we can call an art world. So the existence of art worlds as well as the way their existence affects both the production and consumption of artworks suggests a sociological approach to the arts. It is not an approach that produces aesthetic judgments, although that, that is a task many sociologists of art have set for themselves. So there is an assumption that an artist works in solitary. So by that, the only time the external world is allowed in would be when the work is displayed or displayed and when in circulation. So this would necessitate the seemingly central position that the artist enjoys in the grand scheme of art experience. Although a popular opinion still, it has a considerably, considerably one with the emergence of other art player as a superpower, the curator. So there is an example of a multi-level platform where different players in what we call an art world can engage, interact, and flex their art muscles. So they can flex their art muscles in the international art fair, like the Art Basel in Hong. So this is the Art Basel in Hong Kong 2015. So it is important to note that the complexity of the art world, players are no longer limited to those who undertook formal instruction in either or both production and or study of art. Take for instance at the administrative or uh, managerial rules both of which can exist in either in 
institutional or non-institutional scenarios, these rules may be broken down to working boards. Board of Judges So, the directors and assistant directors managing curators and other, po and other posts whose interest in the management and operations of museums, galleries and other art spaces for independent artists, those outside the wing of a gallery as a stable artist, sometimes required assistance of an artist manager in order to manage their career and sometimes to help them in promoting themselves to the art world as well. So that's all my part in this discussion. So hope you guys learned something about this uh, video or about this discussion. Bye! The process of creating an artwork does not necessarily follow a linear progression. One of the things that one must accept is the fact that the arts have an archaic dimension to it, allowing it to fully harness its creative potential. The process production is essentially tripartite. Tripartite means divided into three categories. First is pre-production, second is production, and the third one is post-production. Pre-production Pre-production is the work done on a product, especially a film or broadcast program, before full-scale production begins. Elements of video production such as the script casting, location scouting, equipment and crew, and the shop list all happen during pre-production. Pre-production is the planning stage. Everything that you need to prepare before the production itself this is where it happens. If you are in a film art, all this preparation, it is where it happens. Production Production is the action of making or manufacturing from components or raw materials or the process of being so manufactured. Production is the actual is the actual filming of the video. Last one is the post production. Post production is the work that is done on a film or recording after filming or recording has taken place. Post production which is often referred to as post is organizing, cutting, coloring, and editing the footage captured in production. So now, let us proceed to medium and techniques. Medium is the mode of expression in which the concept, idea, or message is conveyed. It may be concrete or tangible, such as paintings, sculptures, monuments, and structures or it may be ephemeral or something transient, such as track, for example, recording of a sound. A film or a performance refers to the different materials or supplies that an artist utilizes in order to create a work of art. The technique. The technique of the artwork shows the level of familiarity with the medium being manipulated. The manner and ability with which an artist, dancer, writer, athlete, or the like and employs the technical skill of a particular art or trend and divorce. The body of specialized procedures and the methods used in any specific field, especially in area applied of science. So now let us proceed to engagement with art. The defining roles and nature of exhibitions have had an interesting evolution, changing alongside the demands of the society that purports or partake in its display. In Anna Klein's The Evolving Role of the Exhibition and its Impact on Art and Culture, 2012, she wrote that exhibitions act as the catalyst of art and ideas to the public. 
they represent a way of displaying and contextualizing art that makes it relevant and accessible to contemporary audience. By its very nature, the art displays serve as a mirror to society, reflecting its worries and interests while also questioning its ideas and prejudices. And it's clear that exhibitions are more important not only to the artists who depend on them, but also to the diverse audiences who get to see them. One of the main goals of the art exhibition is to keep art relevant to society, to a wide audience at any given point in history. This is one of the reasons it is so important to the history of art. In Paula Marincola's What Makes a Great Exhibition, 2006, it reads that exhibitions are strategically located at the nexus where artists, their work, the arts institution, and many different public intersect. This is a unique chance because most exchanges in the realm of art can only include two people at once. One of the most popular ways to interact with art is through exhibitions, whether at museums or galleries. Exhibitions provide an opportunity for the various roles in the art world to meet, interact, and even engage in a discussion. Other opportunities for art engagement occur in the classroom. Studio visits, lectures, workshops, and other events that complement the exhibitions. Auction sales, art fairs, denials, trenials, and our other larger showing of not only artworks but also where art is displayed in general. In some cases, an artwork is a standalone or a site specific work that necessitates its display under a slightly different structure or format. Publications are a good approach to introduce the piece of art and allow for its consideration, criticism, and analysis. As with any organized endeavor, the arts and culture have entered into a pace which another aspect of its practice can be realized. An artist or an artisan feels honored, recognized, successful, and accomplished after winning an award. An artist and art artisans gain self-assurance and motivation from it to produce greater masterpieces in the future. Awards enhance the worth of an artist and artisan's works and increase their credibility in the eyes of the general public. The two major awards given to artists in the Philippines are the Order ng Pambansang Alagad ng Sining and Gawad ng Manlilikha ng Bayan. The conferment of the Order of National Artists is the highest national recognition given to Filipino individuals who have made significant contributions to the development of Philippine arts namely music, dance, theater, visual arts, literature, film, broadcast arts, and architectures and allied arts. The order is jointly administered by the National Commission for Culture and Arts, NCCA, and Cultural Center of the Philippines. CCP and conferred by the President of the Philippines upon recommendation by both institutions. NCCA 2015. The very first recipient of this award was Painter, and his name is Fernando Amor Solo who was thought as the grand old man of Philippine art. He was the sole awardee in the year 1972, a national artist for visual arts. Here are 
are some paints of Fernando Amorzolo. At present, there are 66 awardees of this prestigious honor across different art forms. Some of them were given the award posthumously, while others were fortunate enough to receive the award themselves. Some of the honors and privileges that a National Artist Awardee receive are the following. First, they will receive the rank and title as proclaimed by the President of the Philippines. Second, they will receive a medallion or insignia and a citation that will be read during the conferment. Third, they will receive a cash awards and a host of benefits like monthly life pension, medical and hospitalization benefits, and life insurance coverage. Fourth is they will receive a state funeral and burial at the Libingan ng Mga Bayani, Hero Cemetery. And fifth is they will receive a place of honor or designated area during national state functions along with recognition or acknowledgement at cultural events. The most recent conferment was in 2016. The Gawad sa Manlilikha ng Bayan or the National Living Treasures Award was created in 1992 under the Republic Act 7355, also under the jurisdiction of the National Commission for Culture and the Arts. NCCA and the NCCA 2015 through the Gawad sa Manlilikhan ng Bayan Committee and an ad hoc panel of experts. They conduct the research for the finest traditional artists of the land, adapts a program that will ensure the transfer of their skill to other and undertakes measures to promote a genuine appreciation of and instill pride among our people about the genius of the Manlilikan ng Bayan. It was first conferred to the three outstanding artists in music and poetry back in 1993. They are Ginaw Bilog, a master of the Ambahan poetry, Masino Inataray, a master of various traditional musical instrument of the Palawan people, and Samaon Sulaiman, a master of the Kutyapi and other instruments. The recipients of the Gamaba are sought under the qualification of a Manlilikhanang Bayan, who is a citizen Engage in any traditional art uniquely Filipino whose distinctive skills have reached such a high level of technical and artistic excellence and have been passed on to and widely practiced by the present generation in his her community with the same degree of technical and artistic competence. These artists' practice may fall under the following categories Folk, Architecture, Maritime Transport, Waving, Carving, Performing Arts, Literature, Graphic, and Plastic Arts, Ornament, Textile, or Fiber Art, Pottery, and other artistic expression of traditional culture. Some of the incentives accorded to the awardee are the following. First, they will receive a specially designed gold medallion. Second, they will receive an initial grant of 100,000 pesos and 10,000 pesos monthly stipend for life. This was later increased to 14,000 pesos. Third, they will receive a benefit such as a maximum cumulative amount of 750,000 medical and hospitalization benefits. And fourth, they will receive a funeral assistant or tribute fit for a national living treasure. One of the most fascinating historical development in human affairs is the development of the artists. 
He was caught up in the thick of prevailing and shifting ideologies and used the power of creativity and imagination in an effort to make a sense of the world around him from the banalities of the works he created to aid and inform the everyday. Artists are held to a high standard and are subjected to high expectations. As Woodrow Wilson, 1913, relates, You are not here merely to make a living. You are here in order to enable the world to live more apply with greater vision, with a finer spirit of hope and achievement. You are here to enrich the world, and you impoverish yourself if you forget that error.